Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Doing a little Facebook Live on the RedRaiders.com Facebook page. I'm Don Williams from the Avalanche Journal Sports Department. This is Carlos Silva, Jr., also from the AJ Sports Department. And uh, we solicited your questions for a little uh, Texas Tech football chat as we are, what is it, three days away from the season opener on Saturday yep. against uh, Ole Miss down there at NRG Stadium in Houston. It's an 11 a.m. kickoff. And... Uh, Carlos, we got uh, quite a few questions, several folks sent me questions, so uh, I guess we'll get started here right away, and uh, and actually some early, some that were sent earlier this week, Red Raiders mm -hmm. and Tech released their week one depth chart, and uh, that always is something that piques folks' curiosity, and there were a few guys who did not make the two deep that people were specifically interested in, and um, Curtis and Ryan both were curious about uh, Lonzo Gilmore. Not on the two, not on the two deep. Well, here's the deal with Lonzo Gilmore. I think the main reason he's not on the two deep is um, he had knee surgery and shoulder surgery in the off season, and so it's taken him a while to get back. Plus, he's at a position that defensive end spot where you have Eli Howard, who's sort of the established starter mm -hmm. now. And they're not exactly hurting for depth because Quentin Yance is a senior who played last year and Nelson Imbanasor is a redshirt freshman. They expect a lot out of him. And so it's a situation where, you know, Lonzo Gilmore, they like him a lot. And he's really – one of, the, uh, I think, the benefits for him during this time is – during his rehab time is he's gotten really big. He's about 280 pounds, maybe even – a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of have the luxury of uh, not having to really rush him back from these two surgeries. So um, I think you will kind of see him kind of emerge a little bit more as the season goes on. A couple other people asked, uh, let's see, Jerry asked about Houston Miller mm -hmm. not being in the two deep. And Carlos, uh, once again, think, another think death issue, man. <laughs> I, I was going to say, yeah. you, you, I'll, and I'll kind of kick this one over to you. Sure. Does that think about all the people that Texas Tech has at defensive tackle? Mm -hmm. I mean, you just got so many start guys. To, start with the names. Yeah, I mean, well, well, first off, you have to kind of give credit to Mike Thomas last year. He's now with the New York Jets. Certainly a a guy that filled up the middle uh, that everyone kind of remembers. But then all of a sudden, you got Broderick Washington, who's a guy that's really going to step up. I know you kind of mentioned him. You have the the tab right there. He's a guy that's hoping to kind of build off of last year, which was. Not necessarily career year, but certainly a breakout year for him. And then you've got, uh, like you said, just some other guys on the defensive line, like an Eli Howard and some other guys. But just in terms of defensive tackle, I know, uh, trying to remember. Yeah, here, here, here's, here's the, here's oh, the death well, chart. I'll help you out there. There you go. <laughs> you got Preston Gordon, uh, Joseph Wallace. Those were two guys I could not remember. Preston Gordon actually spoke to earlier this this week uh, for a Q and A uh, for some of the stuff that we're doing kind of later on. But a transfer from Rice, who's really kind of stepped in and really kind of opened the eyes of Coach Kingsbury. It, it, it's He's uh, number one on the depth chart. Yeah, it, it's one of the things that Coach Kingsbury was talking about earlier on. It's like you said with the depth and all the other things, but the other thing that you have to look at is even though they bring back 10 of 11 starters from last year on the defensive side, you got some experienced guys to go along with the John Bonney, not to kind of get off topic, but when you look at some of the – the, the guys on the depth chart, the two deep. This is the first time, and I'm sure David Gibbs would kind of agree. I know I've asked him this a couple times, but it's just you're finally in a situation where you can redshirt guys. They can get bigger, faster, stronger, and you're not necessarily having to play them their first year like a Jordan Brooks or a Rico Jeffers. You're kind of throwing them into the fray. Maybe they're getting hurt because they're not ready for that, for the rigors of a 12-game season compared to the high school uh, schedule not only that but then just the other guys that are bigger faster and stronger in the big 12 and I think that's the biggest thing that you're going to take away from this is just you're going to see so many guys rotate in and out and I think that's what David Gibbs was looking for because you're always going to have a fresh guy going 100 percent each time yeah and and to tie back into uh, specifically the defensive tackle position what Miller is battling there is you have really six guys who can play that position you have Washington at Roderick Washington, Preston Gordon being the starters. You have mm -hmm. Joseph Wallace, a guy that a lot of people are expecting to start and very well mm -hmm. could, I think, in the short term. Uh, Nick McCann is a guy who's been here starting his third year now. He's in better condition than he's been. He's down to about 295 pounds. And, and then you have a couple of versatile guys like Nelson and Banasaur that we mentioned a moment ago and, and Quentin Yance or a couple other guys who can play defensive tackle. So it's a pretty stacked position. Uh, a lot of people are wondering where Mason Reed uh, – about Mason Reed not being on the two deep. He's another guy 
that, um, of course, missed the last seven games last year with mm-hmm. a concussion. Yep. Had the symptoms that lasted, bothered him for about three months, and he really didn't feel the same again until right when the season was ending. I think what I think his situation, the reason he's not on the depth chart as you have, uh, yeah, three players fighting for two pos- two spots on that two deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of that hybrid fullback tight end position. You have Dante Thompson. I think when it's a tight end or kind of a flexed out receiver, it'll be mm-hmm. Dante Thompson. When it's a fullback, it's uh, Tyler it's, it's Tyler Carr, Carr mm-hmm. from Canadian, who's you know 270 pounds now. And mm-hmm. So Mason Reed is. Uh, I think he'll get a lot of. He'll see a lot of action. Uh, he's just he's not in the two deep, but I think. Whoever they listed, you're going to ask. You would ask, "Where is where is so and so?" With with Thompson, Carr, and Reed, one of those guys is not going to be in the in the two deep, yeah. and you'd be asking, "Well, where's whichever where's one's so left out?" So, you'd be yeah, asking, "Where's so and so?" Well, the, the the one thing that we can talk about, and I'm sure there were plenty of questions about this, and you can kind of take this question the way you want. I'm pretty sure you know what I'm going to ask, but who's going to start Saturday? I'm sure that was asked a bunch to you as well as to me. And at least from all indications, from what I have seen, just kind of listening to the coaches, I know we spoke about this on the Red Raider podcast, which you can check out, of course, online and all that. But I feel like McLean Carter is kind of your guy. He's got the experience. He did play a little bit against Texas. I know everyone uh, kind of remembers the fact that Nick Shimanek came in in that second half and won the game. But he's he's a guy that will not lose you games. He's going to keep the offense rolling. He's going to keep everything efficient. You have a good running game. You have a good offensive line. And I think that's the important thing is you have this experience on the offensive line. Try and take advantage of it by either running the football, taking the pressure off McLean Carter, who doesn't necessarily have to throw it 35 to 40 times. Maybe he can throw it 25 to 30 times. And those extra times you're running the football and then, of course, getting first downs that way. And more importantly, milking the clock. I think I think the situation with uh, quarterback is – for about three, for about two, three, two and a half, three weeks, something like that. McLean Carter's the guy who's gotten most of the reps, mm-hmm. or he's had the reps kind of tilted his way. Mm-hmm. But I think the situation has been that none of those three guys have really stepped out and mm-hmm. asserted themselves mm-hmm. and seized the job. And that's why, even as recently as a week, in, in the last week or 10 days, I've had a couple of people tell me that. Even internally, that uh, tech is tech coaches are still were still not sure last week who they were going to start because um, a lot of people, a lot of us, are kind of concluding that McLean Carter's mm-hmm. the guy because he seems to be the one getting the most first team reps. Mm-hmm. But I've had people tell me that nobody, none of the three of the guys have really uh, have really stepped forward and made the case that they are the one that needs to be starting. But I'm kind of with you until we get a clear sign otherwise, I think it's going to be McLean Carter. That leads into, uh, I guess, kind of another question that we got. John asked us, did anybody ever find out if Texas Tech has started a left-handed quarterback before the UT game last year? Well, you asked we had a lot question. of discussion about yes. on that about Twitter yesterday, actually. Now, Te- Tech has had two left-handed quarterbacks I can remember in my lifetime. One was Sony mm-hmm. Cavazos in the mid-'90s. And Sony was a backup out of Westlaco High School, who uh, but he never started a game. Mm-hmm. And then in the 70s, and John, the guy John who asked us the question, pointed out that Tech had Randy Page, a left-handed quarterback, yep. who was here for I believe it was, I think he was here for a redshirt year in his freshman year, in the 70s. And in 19, he was a, he was a guy who was a good athlete. He came mm-hmm. out of Oklahoma City, and in 78, which was his redshirt freshman year, they moved him from quarterback to wide receiver and he actually led tech in punt returns and kickoff returns that year and then he got homesick and he transferred to the university of central oklahoma and just tore it up for the last three years for uco and he was actually two years ago in 2016 he was actually on the ballot for the college football hall of fame that's Mm -hmm. how that's how good a college career he had but (laughs) not at texas tech yeah yeah and during the time that he was here he did. He didn't start. He, he didn't start a game at quarterback. Even though he yeah. came here as a quarterback, he actually, he actually threw one pass in that 1978 season. So, Matt Dowdy and the Texas Tech SID staff have researched it, and they said, as far as they know, at least back to the Southwest Conference era that started in 1960, mm-hmm. uh, they don't think that Tech has ever started a left-handed quarterback before yeah. McLean Carter last year. Now, as I point out. 
Tech played 35 years of football before the Southwest Conference yeah, well, era. So, yes. well, <laughs> so, I, so, so, I, so I'm not going to say definitively that they never have, but Tech thinks that, that McLean Carter was the first one at least mm -hmm. from 1960 forward. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny you kind of mentioned the quarterback because we finally got our first uh, Facebook Live here, so we're not going to go to previous questions. We'll get to those. Uh, Joel Arroyo asked, do you think we'll have a 1,000-yard rusher this year? I'm going to default to you because you know how I feel about this trio. You know, I think it's going to be really close um, because I, I think there's a couple of reasons why you could say yes. And one is, as has been, as we've talked to, about kind of at length, mm -hmm. this team needs to run the football, yeah. uh, needs to run the football to take the pressure off the quarterback and, and the inexperienced receivers. Okay, and you have those five offensive linemen back as starters. Um, so I, th I think I'm going to say I'm going to say yes on this one because now I think who, you have. Who do you? I, think? I think De Leon Ward is okay, is, the, is starter, the guy. Yeah, starter on the depth chart. You know, I, I had a discussion with uh, somebody in the football building back yeah. the, this summer, and was asking them about, and we were talking about the running backs, and this person told me that they felt De Leon clearly was the guy who had the higher ceiling yeah. between him and uh, and Trey King. Mm -hmm. And you know he he was a guy who showed some some pretty good durability there mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Um, his freshman year, he had those four games where he carried the ball at least twenty times yep. and and had at least eighty yards rushing. And he's ten pounds heavier than he was then, maybe maybe even more. He's he's in the one ninety to one ninety five mm -hmm. range. So I think DeLeon Ward, if he stays healthy, will kind of seize that job. And he is mm -hmm. listed first on the depth yep. chart. And I think because of the need for Tech to run the football more and because of uh, Kevin John's uh, track record as, a, as an offensive coordinator who has had success in the running game, I think, it, I think it's going to happen. I think DeLeon Ward will get to 1,000. Well, like I've told you before, I think you, you got three quality backs and you got two freshmen in uh, Sir Roger Thompson and Deshaun Henry who could – Obviously, be some change-ups. I do feel DeLeon Ward will get his yards. I don't think it's going to be 1,000. He may get 850, 900. Trey King may get to the 600 mark. And I feel like DeMarcus Felton could maybe get 200, 250. And I think that's the way you get 1,000 yards because I think that's going to be the key to success is not put all this pressure on one player because it's – at least to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Don, but it seems like every time there's been that quote-unquote bell cow, it's been really tough for them to stay healthy. You look at a Justin Stockton, he was the last guy that had back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons, but concussions, he would have De – DeAndre something. Washington. Oh, De no, yeah, DeAndre Washington, Justin. pardon me, thank DeAndre you. DeAndre Washington. Uh, Ju Justin Stockton, when you tried to give him, he obviously had the concussions. You just It's just such a beating when you're a running back, and I think that's – really at a premium and why Texas Tech has a good chance to be really good in the run game this year is because they've got two guys. You've got a Dalion Ward who's a speedster, guy that can get you to the edge, and then a Trey King who's more patient, can get behind your tackles and kind of work that route. And then, of course, Demarcus Felton is more like a bowling ball. He will just put his head down and hit you. I think if you get those three guys, their amount of touches, and you're able to get four to five yards per game with maybe one or two of those guys, I think you're going to be in a good position to win. Maybe not necessarily have the 1,000-yard rusher, but I think uh, you don't necessarily need a 1,000-yard rusher to show that you are an efficient offense. But I know, as you mentioned before, every uh, offense that Kevin Johns has been a part of has had a 1,000-yard rusher. Yeah, so I say it's going to happen. And yeah. uh, Carl said close, but close, but not quite. Uh, you know, to take, uh, go to one of my questions, or you got another question over uh, there? We actually got a couple here. We got uh, Dan Swanson who thinks the Raiders could start 4-0. I'm going to say they're probably not. Ole Miss is going to be a tough one, I think. Although Houston could be an interesting one too with Ed Oliver, I don't know how you feel about it. Um, I think I think I think it's hard. I think it's going to be hard for him to get to four zero. Yeah, and it's not because there's one team that I feel like clearly they're going to lose to that team, mm -hmm. but I think it's just it's uh it's three of the first four games are pretty challenging. I mean, o Ole Miss is challenging, Houston's challenging. Yep. I think they should beat Houston here. Uh, I do think that this is this very well could be the year that Tech beats Oklahoma State, though. I, I agree with that. I mean, there, there's nobody in the Big Twelve. I now I hesitate. Yeah. I start to say. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and say yeah. it. There, there's nobody in the Big Twelve that lost more talent than Oklahoma State. They lost oh, a ton of experience. Yes, I mean, third James team Washington. All America quarterback with Mason Rudolph, James Washington, Blitkoff yep. award winner at wide receiver, and they lost. 
They lost two or three guys in the offensive line who yeah. were real long term guys and, for them. They and lost. They were struggling last year too on the offensive line until they came back. So I mean, yeah, and they, and they and they lost two safeties who played a ton for them: Trey mm-hmm. Flowers and um, Ramon Richards. Yep. So I think this could be the year that Tech actually sneaks up. Not maybe not sneaks up. I think this is could be a real challenging year for Mike Gundy. And uh, but but I don't think I, I'll say no on Tech starting four no just okay. because I think to beat all those teams is going to be a challenge. I agree with you, but the one good thing for Texas Tech is they've got three of those at home, except for, of course, uh, Oklahoma State. So you got Lamar and you got Houston, or pardon me, two, not three. Can't count today. I'm taking. I'm putting. I'm putting Lamar down as a for sure W. I, th- I think. I think all the other three. It's it's how yeah, well it's do you play. Yeah, it's kind of toss up. Yeah, kind of how well do you play? Agree with that, Connor Davis. If Deshaun Johnson is sitting out this weekend, who will fill in for him? Well, fortunately. I have a paper here that shows uh, Deshaun Johnson and a nice story that Don Williams wrote here. That was a cool photo by Brad Tolleson, too. Yes, it was. <laughs> and a nice little headline by yourself. But uh, joking aside, I know you kind of detailed uh, some guys there. John Bonney's a guy that uh, Cliff Kingsbury had mentioned. And then, of course, you got some other guys as well, as we mentioned the death. That they yeah. Um, if Deshaun Johnson cannot go on Saturday because of the shoulder issue that he's had, uh, Cliff Kingsbury said, named four guys yesterday. He said John Bonney. The transfer from the University of Texas. Mm-hmm. He started 15 games for the Longhorns. He played in 37 games, so he's a real experienced guy. Uh, Thomas Leggett is a safety that mm-hmm. – you heard a lot of buzz about Thomas Leggett yep. during the offseason. I think Rusty Witt said he's pound for pound the strongest guy on the team. Which is saying something. Can, can really <laughs> hit. Uh, I know when, when he came here talking to his coach at junior college, he, he described him as um, the modern – secondary player, meaning that he thought he could play cornerback or safety all over the secondary. And he's a guy that kind of had the luxury of redshirting last year. Mm-hmm. And um, and uh, and I think he really took advantage of it because, again, he had a very good spring and, mm-hmm. and an impressive summer in the weight room, all those sorts of things. You have, uh, I think, Vontae Dorsey, I think, of course, will start at the other safety. Yep. You've got a returning starter there who played – 12 games for you last year. So, And Cliff also mentioned Quincy Addison, who's a yep. redshirt freshman, a guy with a really good frame. My guess is if 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 Jashon does not start, I think it would be either Bonnie or, or Leggett. Yep. I'm not sure exactly which with one. With experience or athleticism, you have two choices there because, as Cliff has said, the whole reason he loves uh, John Bonnie is just he's played in the Big 12. He knows – what to do? It's just a matter of just kind of learning the system, which certainly he's a like really he's smart guy. Yeah. And that's the thing about him is he's a really smart guy, big time guy in the classroom. Yeah. Well, just to kind of reset, of course, this is the uh, AJ uh, Facebook Live here. We're talking Red Raider football. Don has a couple questions that were mentioned on Twitter, of course. So we'll kind of mention when we are doing this. We'll take down those questions. He'll have those. But of course, for those of you that are on Facebook, you can look at the comments below us, and you can of course ask your questions there. We'll go about. Uh, usually about 10 to 15 minutes, but if we're pretty good on questions, we'll go a little bit longer. We'll do this every Wednesday. Uh, hopefully starting at 3.30, we had a little bit of technical difficulties today, uh, but of course Brad Tollefson helping us out across the glass over there on the other side. Appreciate you, Brad. Uh, looks like we, we got have about, nothing else here. Okay, I was going to say, we got about five more, so yeah, we're going to need free. to keep moving. Yeah, keep uh, from Robert, uh, and this is, a, this is a question that's been a lot of people have asked about, during, I think, over the course of uh, the last month. Do you think Cliff Kingsbury is having 11 a.m. practices to try to fight against 11 a.m. showings, to fight against lackluster 11 a.m. showings the past several years? And will a.m. practices make any difference as opposed to p.m.? You know, I, I think people have kind of drawn the conclusion that Tech is practicing in the morning to prepare for 11 a.m. games, but I, I really think that's a secondary consideration. I think... The reasoning is they feel like, and Cliff has said this a couple of times, they feel like getting them at the beginning of the day, they feel like they get their best concentration and effort and focus and all those things. Plus, you know, you beat the heat in August. A lot of players that we've talked to have said, hey, it's not as hot, and you can kind of go a little bit. And I think maybe at a higher level, like you said. And so I think I think they feel like they get their best effort in the morning, the best focus, best concentration, and then it ca- and then by 11 a.m. they're done with football for the day, and they have uh, their classes in the afternoon, the entire rest of the day, to take care of their academics. And this is something that uh, it's not real common nationally. I, d- I remember Dean Campbell, a former Texas Tech assistant coach under Spike Dykes, told me that. They had morning practices when he was at North Carolina, 
and, uh, and, and liked it. And this is something that Cliff, Cliff has actually wanted to do in previous years, but this spring was the first time they could get it arranged where all the players on the football team could get all their classes in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And, and they liked, kind of liked how it worked out in the spring, so they're mm-hmm. doing it this season. Well, not only that, but then you have the indoor practice facility, which helps you out too if maybe mm-hmm. it's a hotter day, so you got that too. Uh, not sure if you have maybe the same question here. If you do, then obviously we'll try and kill two birds with one stone. But lack of experience at wide receiver concern to you this year? I think it's a big concern. Yep. Yeah. Um, because uh, you don't really know who your go-to guy is going to be. I say that. T.J. TJ Vasher, I think, should – T.J. Vasher is the guy. Um, though, as you've kind of pointed out, Carlos, the last four or five years, the leading receiver in a tech offense mm-hmm. typically has been the guy playing Y or the guy playing H. J.D. on high is going to be my guy for – top receptions this year just throwing that but out but that's there. the thing you know yeah. outside tj vasher and you know and tj has all the talent in the world but he also had issues with yeah. with catching you know catching mm-hmm. the ball drops yeah. last year i think he's certainly capable of being a big time he has a big time guy he has all big 12 talent but other than that it's uh i don't think you know we're not gonna know until mm-hmm. i mean you can you can take a you can we can poll 10 people Ten media people in town, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and we'll get a wide range of you know, answers on, on who's going who, who's going to be the other guy besides T.J. Vasher. Because although here's the interesting thing when you say that, Don, they have a lot of other options. Well, and that's the thing. Uh, I mean, you look at it. Antoine Wesley is an older guy who's played a little yeah. bit. Coming Daquan, off hip surgery. Coming off hip surgery. Daquan Bowman is an older guy who's played mm-hmm. a little bit. J.D. on High is an older guy who's played a little bit. Yeah. Zach Austin's an older okay. guy who's played a little bit. Out of experience. Seth Collins is an older guy who's played a little bit at Oregon experience. State. Experience. And then you kind of combine those guys with all those with the all the true freshmen that they mm-hmm. have at wide receiver, and I really. Don't have a feel for how this is going to play out. But to answer the question, is it a concern? Yeah, I think it's a big concern. So we'll go with one more here from Facebook to kind of close it out because I know you and I have some actual work to do today. Oh, I, got, I, got, I got a couple more I'm okay. going to run down real okay. quick. No, go ahead. Throw, well, throw it out he, there. He, here's going to be your fun one. The all top two or the, the all is it too early top 25 defense this year. No, and only because you're playing in the Big 12 and you yeah. just don't really have top 25 defenses in the Big 12. Although I will say this, there are a lot of new quarterbacks this year. There are a lot of new quarterbacks so. this year, and I think that's a benefit to Tech yeah. with, because of all the experience that you have on defense. To, to jump into the top 25 would take a quantum yeah. leap. Now, 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 I will say top 50, I think that's – I think even that is hard. And, again, okay. I, I, don't, I don't think that's an indictment of the, of the defense or the personnel. I think that's just the nature of playing football in the Big 12 because yeah. of the way the offenses are. I mean, you look at it most years, most of the Big 12 defenses, ne- nearly all the Big 12 defenses most years mm-hmm. are, are 75 and lower. Because you're giving up about I, – I remember you looked this up. I think it's 20 a game. Is that right? 20 to 25 a game? Well, last year, te- last year Tech, co- last year Tech. Let me go back. Two years ago and three years ago, Tech gave up forty-three points a game. Mm-hmm. Last year, they cut it to thirty-two points a game. Yeah. And so, I've asked people, what, what's the kind of a realistic expectation? You yeah. cut it from forty-three to thirty-two last year. How much lower can it go this year? Mm-hmm. I asked Kirby Hoka at that yeah. last week, and Kirby Kirby kind of thinks about it, and he's like. 24? Yeah. Which, I, which I, I think that if they if they cut their average points per game allowed to 24, that would be fantastic yeah. in mm-hmm. this conference. Yeah. Well, that's the last one from me. So if you want to kind of kill the last uh, two or three or whatever you got, I, I say we call that a day, Don. Uh, let's see. We got uh, a bunch of we them. We got question. like 12 of them. <laughs> where, where, where was it here? Oh. Uh. Once again, we appreciate y'all watching. This is another edition of the AJ Red Raider Football uh, Facebook Live. As you can tell, it's live, so we're kind of looking for questions here. But you can always uh, give us some comments and questions here below. We're going to do this every Wednesday around 3.30 or so. Give it about maybe uh, 20 minutes or so, depending on how many questions. And it looks like Don finally found the question. Okay, I'm, I'm going, to, going to combine two here. Brandon Brandon asked, is Myla Royals redshirting this year? Short answer, no. That, that's actually a good question. And and James asked, who uh, who are some of the players expected to redshirt? And this one's a little tricky because – Yeah, because you got that new rule. you got the new the rule now. Game rule. 
every player, uh, any player can play is up to four games in a season and retain the red shirt. Now, used to, uh, always in the past, if you played one snap in one game. You're done. You're, you're done, yeah. and the only way that you could get that year back was would be if you got suffered a season-ending injury in the first 30% of the games. Yeah, it was like 30, 30 So you had to get hurt. You had to, you had to suffer a season-ending injury by, in week three or week four to be able to get that year back. Now, new NCAA le- legislation passed allows anybody to play up to four games. You can play in four games at any point in the season and retain your red shirt. So that – so you can see some freshmen run out there and play in three or four games, and, yeah. and they'll still be redshirt freshmen next year. So it kind of broke it down. Players that uh, players expected to redshirt. I, I don't think there's any reason for any of your freshman offensive line to play. Yeah. So I'm ruling out Troy Bradshaw, Clayton Franks, Demarcus Marshall, Hakeem White, and Weston Wright. Uh, I, d- I don't think any of those guys play this year, mm-hmm. nor do they need to. Defensive linemen, same thing there with the experience that you have on defensive yeah. line, which we talked about earlier in the show. Just overall defense. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's any reason for Jalen Hutchings or John Scott to play. Linebacker, same thing with Patrick Curley because yep. you have about five experienced linebackers. I think I think the real interesting one is going to be wide receiver. And we've ta- we talked about, okay, there's – mega opportunity for freshman wide receivers yep. to step in and play. And you have a bunch of them. You have uh, Kashan Carter. Carter. Kashan Carter is in the two deep. Then you have Myler Royals, mm-hmm. Eric Azukama, Caden Leggett, a freshman walk-on, who mm-hmm. people can't believe he's a walk-on because he had huge numbers at yep. Georgetown High School, and Tech thinks he's a steal. Yeah. Um, so, and, and Corey Fulcher. Mm-hmm. And then you have Sterling Galban is out for the year with a knee injury. Mm-hmm. So, I – I th- my personal expectation is I think you'll see Carter, Royals, Ezukanma, and Leggett out of that group play, and maybe not Corey Fulcher. Mm-hmm. But it wouldn't surprise me, though, if they get sa- – let's say you get to about week five or week six of the season, and one of these five guys that has been talked about a lot is kind of behind the others. Yeah. I think it wouldn't surprise me if they hold one of those guys back if he hasn't crossed that four-game threshold. That would allow you to bring back a talented wide receiver as a redshirt freshman next year, and kind of that kind of helps balance out your recruiting as well. Uh, you know, one guy will plays to John Henry's, mm-hmm. one of the running backs, and being looked at as a kick return possibility. Yep. And, I, and I think a guy who I'll be interested to see is Xavier Benson. He hasn't really been talked about hardly at all. Tight end, defensive end, outside linebacker from Texarkana, Pleasant Grove. Mike Graham likes him because he's from East Texas. Yeah, state. <laughs> uh, he was on a state championship yep. team last year. Had in an class interception. 4A. Yeah. Had an intercept pick six, wasn't yep. it? Uh, and he caught four passes in yeah, that game. Yeah, I, I know for sure it clinched the game. I can't remember what, what happened with it. Yeah, and he's about 6'2", 6'3", 200 pounds, and he's really athletic. Yeah. And so I'll be interested to see if he plays the red shirts. Uh, I know – after spring ball, Cliff, Cliff told me that he, he kind of listed him tentatively as like the third team guy at one of the defensive end yep. spots or, or rush end spots. He really likes him. Uh, he's a guy who could use some time in the weight room to get bigger and stronger. Um, but he, he is so athletic that uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he's out there on special teams every Saturday. Gotcha. So he's a guy that I'm not really sure about. Uh, but I think because of his athletic ability, he could help you in some ways. So we'll do one more from each of us. Uh, you can pick your best one. I'm going to pick the last one that I see here on Facebook. Once again, appreciate you all with the comments and the questions. Uh, hopefully we'll get this conversation a little bit bigger. We'll try and do this before the game, after the game, and we'll, of course, uh, be happy to answer any questions you have. I know you talk a lot about the wide receivers right now. One guy that I, I totally forgot to mention or just kind of bring up to you is Xavier Martin. He was a former quarterback out of Cibolo Steel. Switched him to wide receiver. Uh, I guess the question is, he's such an athlete. How come we haven't seen him uh, kind of hit the field yet? And that's a good question. Yeah. And it's been – I think um, one, of, one of the reasons why is because he was a quarterback that, yeah. what, senior year at Steel, so he's yeah. playing a new position. Yeah. Well, he, he was a wide receiver. Then they moved him to quarterback mm-hmm. his senior year. Yeah. Then he tried to be quarterback. And then they got him to wide receiver just because of his athleticism from what Cliff Kingsbury had mentioned. And I'm, and I'm not real sure definitively about the answer. I haven't really asked about Xavier yeah. Martin recently, and his mm-hmm. name doesn't come up a lot. Yeah. Um, it could be, like I say, just some guys need 
take longer to develop. Mm-hmm. Some guys need a little while to uh, adjust to, you know, the whole college scene, new the whole position. college football scene, mm-hmm. plus the new position. Yeah. You know, he does have he does have talent. He does have ability. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, but, you know, again, he's a red shirt freshman, yeah. so he's got time. So he's got time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you got anything from you? If not, I got one more, and we'll call it a day. James had asked a question. He said, "Status on Nelson." I'm not sure if he Banasaur? meant Nelson and Banasaur. I'm maybe? guessing. I can't think of any other. Nelson person. and Banasaur, the guy that they really like. Yeah. And he can play. You know, the buzz on him is David Gibbs says he can play really anywhere on the defensive line. He can mm-hmm. play defensive end. He can play that four technique tackle, defensive tackle. Yeah. Um, I, I think they will. My guess is they that he will get about mm, probably fifteen or twenty snaps a game, and the reason why is because I, you know I don't think I don't think you take Eli Howard off the field no, for absolutely. him, and I don't think you don't take Broderick Washington off no. the field for him. Um, so while they really like him, mm-hmm. um, I don't think he, I, I see him as more of a kind of a role player right now mm-hmm. as a redshirt freshman yeah. than as. Uh, than, than knocking somebody out, of, than knocking a more experienced kind of established player out of the starting lineup. Which once again, it just goes to show the depth that's been built over the four years that David Gibbs has been here. You've gotten to a point where a kid is not necessarily kind of pushing his way there. You've got some established guys as you mentioned, and you can kind of throw them in when needed. And Nelson and Banasor, you mentioned David Gibbs has mentioned it by name, which is something he normally doesn't do with defensive mm-hmm. players. So certainly yep. he's made an impression with the fourth-year defensive coordinator. Anything else you want to mention there, Don, uh, other than the fact that you'll be uh, driving to Houston with Brad Tollefson later this week and I won't be able to, to join you? Uh, well, I've got one more. Robert asked sure. that. This one could be a little bit more in-depth, though. How do you, how do you expect – Robert says, how do you expect the offense to be different with Kevin Johns helping Cliff call plays? I'm I'm just going to say it's, for lack of a better term, not dink dunk, but I think they're going to be more efficient in terms of we're going to take maybe one or two deep shots during a during a drive rather than try to hit that home run almost every time. I, I think they're going to run the football a lot more and establish their pass through the run and wait until it, an opposition kind of fills the box, and that's when they're going to take their shots. Because as you mentioned before, T.J. Vasher, Antoine Wesley, two guys that are above 6'4", I think those are two guys that are yearning to make that big play, especially like you said when T.J. Vasher had some big plays last year, and unfortunately the football just wasn't able to get catched by him. Yeah, I think it's – this might be the biggest mystery of this team, I think, is what how exactly does Kevin Johns – what exactly is the stamp that he puts on the offense? And Cliff Kingsbury has said that – on the one hand, Cliff has said – you know, take throws the football. Tech is yep. going to continue to do what we do, of course. as he said. But he brought in Kevin John specifically because he wanted someone who was not in that Mike Leach, Dana Holgerson style, how mummy air raid, air raid. Air, yeah, that air raid coaching tree. He wanted someone to come in who, who could bring some different ideas and mm-hmm. who could help them run the football more effectively. So I'm interested to see kind of how that mixes and how that blends. But, you know, I kind of keep, I keep going back to this. Um, the thing that that kind of jumped out to me from day one when Tech brought Kevin Johns here is the last four years he's had five guys who rushed for 1,000 yards. Yep, which we brought up. <laughs> and, uh, and has that reputation for using big backs and tight ends a lot to, you know, help your blocking. And he has some guys who can, he has some pieces that he can kind of work with there mm-hmm. with Tyler Carr and and Dante Thompson who yep. they kind of tried to use as more of an inline tight end and yep. blocker. So I think um, it's, as far as uh, the game day operation, Kevin Johns is going to be he'll be upstairs, he'll be in the box in much the same way Eric Morris was last mm-hmm. year, and so he'll kind of be the eyes in the sky for Cliff, and I think he'll be kind of a give and take. I, th- I think he'll be making suggestions and saying, hey, they're doing this on the back end. I think this will work. Mm-hmm. And Cliff might say, okay, yes let's no. give that a shot. And so while people have been very um, interested in who's going to be the guy who call, who's calling plays, yeah. Cliff is the guy who has final say, yep. but Kevin, Kevin Johns is going to have a lot of input. Well, once again, Don, uh, this is our first inaugural uh, AJ Media Avalanche Journal Facebook Live. Uh, appreciate the time, Matt. I know you're a busy man with uh, Texas Tech football starting up 
Of course, Texas Tech's taking on Mississippi or Ole Miss, whichever one you want to use, at 11 a.m. Saturday at NRG Stadium in Houston. Texas Tech last year, 6-7, six and seven, Mississippi 6-6. Six and six. Both teams are unranked. The last time they played, of course, you look this up, Mississippi won 47-34 to 34 in the Cotton Bowl after the 2008 season. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. There was one where Tech led 14 to nothing early, and you thought it was going to be a Tech route. And then uh, Dexter McCluster kind of uh, – It's an impressive name. Dexter McCluster put a whipping on the Red Raiders, unfortunately, that day in the Cotton Bowl. Well, we'll see if uh, Texas Tech is able to do a different deal this time when they play an SEC team. Of course, you can check out all the coverage on RedRaiders.com and LubbockOnline.com. You can follow Don Williams at AJ underscore Don Williams. I'm Carlos Silva, the sports editor here at the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. For Don Williams, we appreciate you watching another or our first AJ Media Facebook Live here talking about Red Raider football. We'll talk to you later this week.